I announced that we were going to take a convoy from Britain to Gaza. And in three weeks, we had gathered 110 British trucks, ambulances, fire engines, vans, medicine, wheelchairs, children's nappies, biscuits, flour, blankets for the 61,000 Palestinian families whose homes were destroyed in 22 days. Can you imagine? 61,000 homes in 22 days destroyed in that bombardment. Blankets for them, tents for them. We gathered 110 vehicles, 350 British volunteers and $2 million worth of aid in just three weeks. And on St. Valentine's Day, and on St. Valentine's Day, we set off from Hyde Park in London with love for Palestine. It was a long and difficult journey. 10,000 kilometers, eight countries, sleeping in our vehicles almost every night, driving until it was late, sleeping a few hours, sitting up in our cars, driving the next morning with no showers, no breakfasts, just driving and driving, determined to reach Palestine as quickly as we could. We passed many difficult borders. The Algerian and Moroccan border had to be blowtorched open to allow our convoy to pass. Can you believe it? Even Sykes and Picot hadn't figured that one out. The Arab countries would shut their borders for 16 years and that those borders would be rusted shut so that you needed flames to open them. Actually, the border opened twice in 16 years and both times for me in 1999 with a convoy to Baghdad and in 2009 with a convoy to Gaza. They should, you know, they really should make me the envoy between Morocco and Algeria. I could sort out this problem, whatever it is, overnight. But we passed through countries that hated the sight of us, regimes that didn't want us to be there but couldn't stop us because of the head of steam, because of the momentum which we had by then developed. They tried everything they could. They made us avoid the towns and the cities. Traffic congestion, you see. They took us down desert roads. They deployed their army and their police to stop people seeing us. But the people pushed through anyway, pushing through the police, pushing through the soldiers to touch the convoy, to give us biscuits for Gaza, to hold up their babies, to be kissed by the convoy, to spread the barakat amongst their families. It didn't matter what these regimes said, the people in their countries loved Palestine and wanted to be with us on that convoy. Women were taking off their wedding rings and forcing them through the windows of the cars, saying, take this to Gaza, sell it, melt it, do anything, give it to Gaza. An old man in Algeria begged me to take him in the back of my van. I told him, I sleep in the back of that van. There's no room in the back of that van. And you don't have a passport. And you're a, an, you're a fellahin. They're not short of fellahin in Gaza. They don't need you there. What do you want to do when you get there? He said, I just want them to know that when they cry, we are crying with them. And when they bleed, we are bleeding with them. And that was true in every country, in every person that we met, every person who forced their way through the efforts of their regimes to keep us away from them. And finally, we reached the great Egypt. The heart, not really, wallahi, Egypt is a great, great country and the Egyptian people are a great, great people.
not their fault they have the government they have. They didn't choose it after all. Well, 90, only 99.9% .9 of them did. <laughs> People said to me, why didn't you sail this, this material to Alexandria and drive quickly to Rafa? I said, because I wanted to give the Egyptian government plenty of time to think about us. <laughs> plenty of time to know that we were coming. Plenty of time to know what the cost would be if they treated us like they treated Denis Kucinic and other people who have headed for that border since this aggression began. Plenty of time to know that when they were dealing with us, they were dealing with people who came in peace. Peace for all the Arab regimes. I made this clear in Hyde Park. We come in peace, but we will not be stopped. And when we reached the little town of al -Arish, some kind of schizophrenia developed. When we crossed the Egyptian border at Saloum from Libya, where, thanks to the Gaddafi Foundation and its leader, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, they doubled the size of our convoy from 110 to 220 vehicles. A massive convoy. A massive convoy about five miles long. This convoy was about five miles long by the time it reached al -Arish. And they made us stop in a car park. And what a night. One night in al -Arish. It would make a great road movie, actually, but it's not as exotic as it sounds. It was a desperately dissatisfying place for this convoy to make its final rest before we headed for Gaza. The Egyptian government, which had declared to its own people that we were their guests, guests of the ruling party in Egypt, guests of the National Democratic Party in Egypt, which had held up pictures of the president behind me at every stop, in every speech, in every interview I gave, which helped us, which paid for our petrol even, suddenly asked me to go to Rafa ahead of the convoy. And when I got to Rafa, they asked me to cross into Palestine without the convoy. I told them I came all this way with a convoy. I'm not going to walk naked into Palestine without a convoy. They said, well, there are some problems with the convoy back in the car park in al -Arish. I said, I refuse to cross. I got out of my vehicle. I spread my sleeping bag on the ground and I lay down. And all the cameras started taking pictures. And they got quite spooked about that told them I'm staying here until the convoy arrives. They said, well, maybe you'd better go back to the car park and see what's happening. When we got back to the car park, I found that my friends were surrounded by 1,000, 1,000 Egyptian police and that they were insisting that Egyptian officials go through each and every one of these vehicles and separate out that material which could go through Rafa from the material which would have to go through the Israeli checkpoints. I told them, we won't be going through the Israeli checkpoints at all. You can forget this. They said, you have to coordinate with Israel. I said, I never coordinated with Israel in my whole life. I'm not going to start now. I'm not going to start now. They said, well, this material has to be separated. I said, in that case, we'll put all the material back on the trucks and I will lead this convoy all the way back through Egypt, back to Libya, and you can explain to your people why we didn't cross with this aid into Palestine. 
Well, they didn't fancy that either. So we reached a compromise. 